55 years. That's how long Del Delker has been singing her love for Jesus with the voice of prophecy. It just seemed right to get together and celebrate. So using the talents of all our technicians, we planned a huge family reunion with Del and her friends. A musical tribute. Share the memories as we reminisce together and sing some of Del's favorite songs. Join us, Del and Friends. is a sweetheart. Uh, she's uh, the queen of gospel music. Always encouraging, always there when you're hurting. And uh, what a sweetheart. He had me on his mind long before was begun He had me on his mind long before a bird had ever sung and long before the earth was formed long before the sky and sea Thinking of 
You know, we've had the privilege of traveling around the world and singing in many, many different countries, and also the real privilege of presenting our Lord and Savior in many different languages. Do you have any idea at all how many languages you've sung in? Uh, Jerry, I think it's uh, 15. Well, let's see your name them. English, Spanish, <laughs> Portuguese, Japanese, Chinese, Vietnamese, Ukrainian. Is that enough? Uh, <laughs> Ilocano. <laughs> Arabian. I think I saw that on the list. Arabic. There. Arabic. Arabic. Right, yeah. I, I was pretty good at that because the coach I had was in love with me. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> you want to hear a little Arabic? Sure. Ya laita li al falisan li shukri fadil mu'minin All right! <laughs> but you know the quartet has sung in more. You guys always had to do more than I. You couldn't bear the competition. That's right. So you did how many? 28? I think we're in 28 now. Oh. Yeah. You missed the uh, Navajo language. Yes, Navajo too. One of the toughest. Yes, it was. But you know, years ago you made that song, The Love of God, sort of your signature song, and, and you're quite well known from it. I remember as a small boy I used to listen to you. Uh, <laughs> and, I, and I thought how wonderful it would be to you know, just sing with you someday. Yeah, I bet you did. <laughs> but uh, do you remember the first time you ever sang that song, The Love of God? Yes, I do. Um, I was baptized in March of 1947, before many of you were ever hatched. And um, in June of 47, I was asked to sing at the Lodi camp meeting. That's right. And uh, I didn't know very many songs. I knew Old Rugged Cross and a few of those, but I didn't know very many. So I started searching through songbooks that somebody loaned me, and I found that one. And it was so easy that even without my any musical skills, I picked it out and sang that at the Lodi camp meeting. And afterwards, people came up in front and slobbered all over me. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, because they'd never heard it before. Yeah, it and, uh, and my head started swelling. And the peace of God went out of my heart when ego climbed up on the throne. And I went into the grape vineyard next door when everybody was gone and right in the, I had a little rented room. And I went to the grape orchard and I kneeled down and prayed. I said, God, if a voice is going to keep me out of the kingdom, take it away. I want to go to your home someday. Well, your voice has blessed so many through the years, Dell. Well, thank the and, Lord for uh, that. And he has yours too, dear. Yeah, thank you, but especially that song. And we'd, we'd love to hear you sing it today. Would you do that for us? Yes, sure. I found in him 
him a friend so strong and true I would tell you how he changed my life completely He did something that no other friend could do came to the Oregon camp meeting when I was 14 and sang the song, The Love of God. And I was feeling almost suicidal, really. I was in a real low time, and I thought, but as I listened to the words about God's love reaching to the deepest hell, um, and I listened again to a, to a verse that she was singing about, could we with ink the ocean fill, and, and I thought, and to write the love of God above. And the theology that she taught me through her songs has just made my life so different. And I even had one therapist tell me that he thinks she saved my life. And I think so too. Del, would you please come forward? Del, we stand in awe of you today. And I think one of the reasons is, is that throughout your career, you have always given the glory to God. 
And we just want to give you this bouquet of roses to honor you today because we love you. Thank you. Thank you so much. How beautiful. Well, the next song has a story. There is a Methodist, a Baptist preacher's wife in Pomona. Her name is Ruth Calkin, and she's my friend, but I didn't know her before I found this song. And when I found it, I did some research, found out her name. And she told me how it was written. I love to find out. How about you other singers? Do you like to find out how songs were written? They always mean more to me. One day she was in her home, and uh, she received a call, a very tearful lady on the other end. And she said, oh, Ruth, something terrible has happened. My little boy was in our backyard, and he was swinging back and forth on a rope tied to the limb of a tree. And uh, I was doing things in my kitchen and then went back to the window and there he was hanging by his neck with his rope around him. I guess he was just being playful and, and was going to see if he could, his neck could take it. Well, it couldn't. And so she called and she says, we've rushed him to the hospital and he's barely breathing. Please pray that he'll live. Little Bobby Bradley, his name was, and uh, well, the bottom line is he did not live. And uh, she says, I just can't take this, she said to Ruth. I can't take it. I can't bear to lose him. He was about seven, eight years old. And so Ruth was so distressed, and she went to her uh, music room, and she wrote this wonderful song. Now, that was a tragic thing to happen, but I tell you, I wish you could read the letters that I've gotten when this song has been aired. Because people, so many people are going through terrible problems and this song has been a blessing to them. You singers here, get it and sing it because it's, it's a blessing to people. But I do know I do not know oh Lord why it should be thy will for me to bear so much of heartache End of pain I do not know, O oh Lord Why it should be thy will For me to suffer loss When I had prayed for gain Yes. 
she had wanted to get into show business. That was her goal, her, her ambition. But when she met the Lord, it changed her whole perspective. She used to tell us that when the, when the Voice of Prophecy first contacted her to come, she said no. And her mother got after her. She says, are you sure that you're not saying no to the Lord, you know, when you should be saying? And so she came. And it was a disappointment to her for the first, I suppose, two or three years because she came primarily as a secretary, but she carved out her own niche in the Voice of Prophecy um, program and became, became increasingly known and respected and loved by our radio audience. As they walk inside, singing hallelujah, home at last, the redeemed are home at last. See the lame come around hear the dumb sing a song of praise. The blind are outside, seeing while the old folks stand in place. Around the great white throne, we're the king of kings. When we first started to work with her in the studio, we found immediately what a wonderful, bright, cheery personality she had and uh, her keen sense of humor. I'm sure that uh, people who have been around her much find that she has quite a storehouse of one-liners. I just got to tell you something that happened a while back on one of our family reunion tapes. Uh, we clapped and looked happy. We thought it was appropriate. And uh, oh, I got a call from a little old lady, probably about 15 minutes older than I am. And, and uh, she said, I am so disappointed that you would have a part in something like that. Well, I said, what was your problem? Oh, the clapping and so on. I says, well, to tell you the truth, when Jesus comes back, I'm going to be jumping up and down. I'm going to be... <laughs> I'm going to be turning cartwheels. <laughs> now, I said, if you want to sit in your corner and do your knitting, that's okay with me. <laughs> she has terrific humor. And yet, at the same time as the humor, the often blunt humor or the wittiness is the gentle compassion that is there at the same time.
He took a miracle of love and grace. My Father is omnipotent, on that you can rely. A God of might and miracles, tis written in the sky. The most remarkable gift Dell has is what she does behind the scenes that most people don't even know about. Uh, she has mentored literally hundreds of people. Uh, I don't know how she remembers everyone she remembers. She is truly one of the most pastoring people that I have ever known. And, uh, and her caring spirit and her deep love uh, is completely genuine. And everything you see about Dell is genuine. It's real. Folks, this is Hugh Martin. I think almost everyone in the world knows your famous Christmas song, Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas, but I don't think very many people have heard the religious version. That's right. They will now, won't they? <laughs> yes. Just a few years ago, uh -huh. he wrote the uh, Christian words. Hugh, uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about your life. Okay. Um, Let's go back to, you see, you were born in, in Alabama, weren't you? Birmingham, Alabama. Right. And you were going to college, and then uh, ditched college, didn't you, because you were... Well, I just was, couldn't wait to get to New York, because that's where it was all happening. And I wanted to see if I could strike out or make it. And uh -huh. you made it, uh -huh. didn't you? <laughs> well, thanks to God, I did. <laughs> uh, tell me a bit about the uh, people that you met during those years. Uh, some of the people that you uh, played well, for. Well, Dick Rogers of uh, Rogers and Hammerstein, and at that time he was Rogers and Hart. He was wonderful to me. He was really my mentor, and uh, I felt almost like Dick's son. He, he really almost adopted me and taught me how to write music and how to edit, edit it and get out the dull parts and 
Oh, I learned so much from Dick. Mm -hmm. And then from Dick, you started playing for different uh, household names, really. Yes, I did. Uh huh. Come on now, you can drop names. Can here. I drop names? <laughs> sure. <laughs> It sounds so pretentious to do it, but I don't know how else to do it because I was lucky enough to be with so many fascinating people. I gave Gene Kelly his first choreography job, and I was a Judy Garland's accompanist at the Palace when she right. made that historic uh, comeback at the Palace for 19 weeks. Didn't you write Meet Me in St. Louis especially for her? And oh, that's yes. where you wrote the famous Christmas song. That's right, right? yes. The first mm -hmm. lyric I wrote was very lugubrious, and, and Judy listened to it and she said, if I sing that to that little Margaret O'Brien, the audience will think I'm a monster. And she <laughs> what said, was it? Oh, you want me to sing it? No, I mean... Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you briefly no, what the please lyric sing was. It. No, I'll tell you. Well, all right, what, you hold this. Let's see. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. It may be your last. <laughs> Next year, we may all be living in the past. <laughs> wow. And, and it just got worse after that. <laughs> <laughs> so Judy said, please write me another lyric. And I said, no, you know how arrogant young people are. <laughs> and I said, no, take it or leave it. I'll, I'll write you another one. And she said, oh, I wish you'd write this one. I love that little madrigal tune. So finally, I did, because I would have been an idiot not to. <laughs> and, uh, well, Frank, and Frank Sinatra called you and, and said, hey, change those words. I'd like to use your song, didn't he? Yes, even Frank, after we, I had changed them once, said, I'm doing an album called A Jolly Christmas, and uh, do you think you could jolly it up a little bit for me? <laughs> and that was when I wrote the line about hang a shining star up on the highest bough. I wrote uh -huh. that for Frank Sinatra. And, uh, well, anyway, that's enough yeah, name, enough name dropping. dropping. You're my favorite name. We don't need those. Hey! Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 as a matter of fact, uh, I, had a, I had a magnificent obsession in the, uh, in the uh, was it the 50s that we met? No, it was 50s. much later. So I, <laughs> I've lost about 20 years somewhere. <laughs> But Late when, 70s. When I heard Dell on the Voice of Prophecy, I thought, that's the most beautiful voice I've heard since Judy. And I was just dying to be her accompanist. And I can't believe I'm sitting here about to play for her. It's just a, <laughs> a dream come true. Well, he came to... He came to Glendale when... Uh, Tell us about that, when you were just ready to give up your apartment because I, you said, well, you've I got came, Jim Teal, you don't need anybody else. Uh, uh, I don't, still never fill Jim Teal's shoes, but, <laughs> but, the, but Jim was gone by the time I came on board, and so I was glad you had somebody. Uh, I came to Newbury Park and took an apartment with the idea that I would be Dell's accompanist, come rain or come shine. I don't, yeah. I and don't, then nothing happened. Nothing so. happened for two years, and so one day I went to the door to go to the office to give up my apartment because I had given up all hope of ever being Dell's accompanist. And the door opened, and as it opened, there was Dell. And I said, what are you doing here? And she said, you tell him. Well, I said, um, I just happened to know some news, and I think that in the future I'm going to be needing you more. And uh, you just turned around and walked back into your house. You well, didn't ask why. <laughs> uh, Dell said, do you think you can hang on for one more month? Yes. And I said, oh, well, I've been sitting on my duff for two years. I, <laughs> I might as well sit on it for one more month. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, then he stepped in when I truly, really needed him. We used him some when uh, uh, Jim was not available. Yes. But anyway, we had a wonderful time traveling together. No offense, Jim. <laughs> um, I think we traveled together for about four years. Four years. Yes. Four happiest years and, of my life. Uh, we, the reason Hugh is saying that he's enjoyed his work with me is not just because of me. It's because of what we were doing. We were uplifting the name of Jesus Christ. Yeah, that's true. And there's nothing more important than that. Mm -hmm. And we had a wonderful time. And, and Hugh charmed. He charmed the audiences with his sincerity, and he learned how to talk in front of people. <laughs> Thanks to you. <laughs> oh, we must tell about uh, the, the charming black man you met in... Oh, the, yes. Yes, in the hospital. Uh -huh. Tell him about that. Well, I went in for a checkup in Birmingham, Alabama, and I had asked for a private room because I wasn't feeling 
well, I didn't look well, and I didn't want to see anybody. And um, as I walked into the lobby of the hospital, this is going to sound weird, but it really happened just like this. As I walked in, I heard a voice. It wasn't an audible voice, but it was a commanding voice, and I knew it was from God. And it said, Hugh, share your room. I blinked. I couldn't believe what I'd just heard because I'd gone to all this trouble to get the private room. So I just sort of shook it off and ignored it, and then it came again. Hugh, share your room. So I went to the desk and said, do you suppose you could switch me to a ward or a, a semi-private or something? And she looked at me as if I'd gone crazy. She said, you just put me through my, you know, everything to get you this room. <laughs> and I said, well, do you have one? And she said, no, as a matter of fact, we don't. And I said, well, okay, and I was getting ready to go up to the private room, and the phone rang, and she said, hey, wait a minute, we have a cancellation. Well, you'll never guess who they put me in with, a Seventh-day Adventist black preacher. <laughs> and I was so touched by this man. He had just had a painful operation, and I heard the doctor say, now, you're not to get out of bed, no matter what happens. You've got your urinal, and everything's all right, and you're not going to get out of bed for any purpose whatsoever. And he left the room. It was about sunset on Friday night, so I guess you know what's coming. He climbed out of bed very slowly and very painfully and knelt down and prayed. And then he slowly clambered back into bed. And I said, Brother Lester, you heard what the doctor said. Why did you do that? He said, well, I love the Lord so much, and it's Friday night, and the sun is setting, and my Sabbath is beginning. I simply had to honor him. And of course, <laughs> the tears came, as they're coming now, just a little bit. And I did become an Adventist that night. But uh, the voice of prophecy had a lot to do with it, because I had listened. I was hoping you'd get uh, to yes. that. Yes. <laughs> well, it's absolutely true. I had fallen in love with Zell's voice, so I listened every day, and uh, part of the uh, penalty for listening was to get the message and finally I began to like the penalty an awful lot because HMS Richards was pretty marvelous and so I began I was softened up for brother brother Lester and Ruth well it's just a pleasure to have you here with well, us. you're still my favorite my darling <laughs> Christmas future is
Dell is always near and dear, and, and through the past years, I mean, since I left the quartet in 83, you know, Dell is no less close now than she ever was. I mean, we talk. Either I call her or she calls me, uh, oh, probably at least once a month, you know, and I'm not unique. I know she's calling everybody. You know, Dell never loses touch with anyone like that, so... That's why I'm here. She's just a dear, dear friend. She's family. She's just, just a great, just a great person, and uh, maybe one in a half a century here. Fifty-five years. You know, most people can't hang on to a job for three months, but uh, for her to wear so well with old and with the young, it's just a phenomenon. i 
to the bones. I heard about old Daniel. He was praying in the lion's den. I heard about little David picking up five smooth stones. crusade in um, uh, Orlando, Florida. And while we were there, we understood that George Beverly Shea was coming to town to put on a concert on Sunday afternoon. And so I said to Adele, let's go. So she and Phyllis and I went, and we sat through the crusade. Well, just at the end of the, I mean, of the concert, just at the end of the concert, I got, I got out, and I went up and went backstage, and as soon as uh, George Rivershay came backstage, I came up to him and I said, did you know that Del Delker was in the audience? He said, Del Delker, he said, I've always wanted to meet her. Would you have me meet her? And I, so I ran back and got Del, and she met him, and he reached out and he grabbed her hand, and he kissed her hand, and he said, Del, he said, you have been a blessing in my life. And that was one of the biggest thrills for me, to just stand there and watch that. I trust in God wherever I may be upon the land or on the rolling sea for come what may from day to day my heavenly Father watches over
guessing that our first meeting was uh, with her was in November of 66 in Cleburne, Texas, when the Voice of Prophecy invited us out for a weekend to sing for evangelistic meetings that Harold Jr. was holding. The VOP recognized that we were doing some music for kids that, that was important. And our music was uh, kind of a popular idiom at the time, folk music, and we were doing gospel folk. And it was a good fit with the voice because they were into reaching out and creating connections with people, and we were doing that with kids, so that, that gave us a fit. But our memories, you know, of her as a person would have come from the following summer. Well, we spent a lot of time on the road with her. I mean, it, it was fun to perform with her and sing with her and be with the voice, but, but the, the downtime, the traveling time, the fun time was when we'd go bowling or go out to eat or tell jokes. or It was just a great time. She's like a big sister to us. And being on the road with somebody was what... Uh, really sort of made her real um, and uh, that's where we learned how much fun she could be how much balance she had in her life how real a person she she is she really nurtured us she protected us she encouraged us i mean we love her that's why we're here this world is not my home i'm just a passing Treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend. Thank you. 
He had used us to do the uh, <laughs> the, the two o'clock get him to come back thing, you know, at camp meeting, and uh, and so they'd scheduled our family in for that, and we were doing that, and then and then the the quartet and Dell and uh, Elder Richards were coming on to do their thing that afternoon, so uh, so we were up there singing our hearts out with the kids, and. Uh, and it was time for us to get off and for them to come off. So as we were going off, Dell stopped and grabbed Donna by the arm and she says, you guys don't go anywhere. You wait in the wings and I'm gonna be right back. I wanna talk to you. And uh, so anyway, we got out there and I remember Donna turned to me and she says, I wonder how she's gonna pull this off. Well, she got up, sang her song, sat down, started coughing. <laughs> And the cough got worse and worse, and finally she excused herself and left the platform. As soon as she got off the wings, she grabbed both of us, just beaming as only she can. She says, it works every time. Yeah. So anyway, she, she introduced herself to us, and, uh, and she says, wanted to know what we were doing with our music, and was this a hobby, and, you know, and she says, I'm going to commit this to prayer. She says, she says, you kids need, you need to do this. She says, you just need to do this. She says, you have got a ministry. And then when she shared her story of how she helped Wedgwood, yeah. you know, Donna turned to me uh, at one of our tapings and squeezed my arm and said, isn't that something? She's been doing this all of her life. Yeah. She's been helping people. You took my feet from the miry clay. Yes, you did. Save my soul. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. He ransomed me and made me whole. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. I can tell the world. in uh, almost 75 years of broadcasting history. The Voice of Prophecy has affected so many people for Jesus Christ and they've come to know Him personally and also so many individuals have been affected and influenced by your music in the uh, 55 some years that you've been with this ministry. The Lord. But the gentleman who just sang part of this song, Moses Brown, particularly has a story. Well, let's let him tell it with you. Come on down, Moses. Moses, I'm so glad that you could come and be with us all the way from Tampa, Florida. Right. That's a long ways. It's very long. You must like me. Love you. <laughs> <laughs> we met first in Orlando, Florida when we were there for a Vision Builders. Yes, ma'am. And uh, 
You came up to me and you said, you saved my life. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't save your life. We know that. But someone else did. Praise God. Can you tell me what you meant by that? I meant that it was some time ago, years ago, there was a little girl, 15 years old, who was brutally raped when she was walking away from church. And during that time, she was trying to figure out what she should do with this child. Her parents had died, and she didn't know what to do. And on her way home, the nine months pregnant, she was still trying to figure out, should she have this child because she couldn't feed it? She was very poor. And she said, Lord, if you just get the child right home, I'll give him to you. And she heard that voice constantly telling her, let the baby live. And from that, that time, she left the baby in the hospital after she birthed it. And they called, the doctor called a young lady who loved to adopt kids. And she was a Seventh-day Adventist lady, her and her husband, Leroy and Annette Brown. And they named this little black, beautiful boy named Moses Brown. <laughs> <laughs> But what came in my life, what saved my life as I grew up, my mother used to play the voice of prophecy all the time. You didn't particularly like it, did you? No, I didn't like it. I didn't like too much of the Dell singing all the time, but she played it and played it and played it. I wanted to hear Dinah Ross, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I listened to Oh How I Love Jesus. The words that you sang penetrated my heart and in my rebelliousness. And I'm, about to give up in my life because I found out I was adopted. I didn't want to live no more. But those songs just kept going and going. And it brought me back to Christ and I surrendered all. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> That's what it's all about. I surrender all to Jesus.
She is a good-natured person. She loves people genuinely, and she loves her ministry. She loves the voice of prophecy. And it's my goal to keep her singing for as long as she comes, hopefully till the Lord comes, because when she's out there, she's blessing the people. Even if she just walks on the stage, she reminds people of a connection with the Lord and of times in their past when they found Jesus through her songs and her testimony. Bosnia to the Middle East, from China to Jakarta, to North America, South America. That has been the prayer of God's people. My Jesus, I love you. You know, the flight on planet Earth's gotten a whole lot more bumpy since September 11. Nothing is the same. Everything's different. But God's people have a wonderful, blessed hope. They're looking forward to a grand and glorious reunion because more than anything else that drives us forward and gives us courage from one day to the next, one challenge to the next, is Jesus one of these days soon is going to descend those eastern skies because the King is coming. Oh, the marketplace is empty, no more traffic in the streets all the builders tools are silent no more time to harvest wheat busy housewives cease their labors in the courtrooms no debate 
work on earth has all suspended as the king comes through the gate oh the king is coming the king is coming i just heard the trumpet sounding and now his face i see oh Those whose lives have been redeemed, broken homes that he has mended, those from prison he set free, little children and the aged hand in hand stand all aglow, who were crippled, broken, ruined, clad in garments white as snow. I can see the marching throng, the flurry of God's trumpets spells the end of sin and wrong. Regal robes are now unfolding, heaven's grand stands all in place. Heaven's choir is now assembled, start to sing amazing grace. I just want to take a minute to say thank you for sharing this family reunion moment with your Voice of Prophecy family. I want to encourage each of you to complete your collection of family reunion music by calling 1-877-HOSANNA right now. That's 1-877-467-2662. Call them and ask for information about what other products are available in this family reunion series. I know you'll enjoy all of them.